So I think there usually comes a point in people's lives where they intuit home and a way which promises something we've felt missing in our lives up until then. The Buddha said that suffering can result in either bewilderment or a search. And there's an alternate version of the cycle of dependent origination where instead of the links and the chain of suffering leading back into more ignorance, more bewilderment, more becoming, they lead to faith, confidence, to joy, to samadhi, and to liberation. And whenever I hear about these moments, the pivot point of a life where someone somehow, suddenly understands that there's a way out, there's a different way of living, these are the most meaningful stories I know of. Suddenly a path opens and you find that there's a footprint that feels it was made for you and you stepped into it or a longing you've held your whole life somewhere in your heart has a voice and a form. And for me, uh, it was when I was 15, and I read uh, Herman Hesse's Siddhartha, like many a burgeoning hippie. And it's actually a pretty non-Buddhist book in many ways, but it was my first image of the Buddha. And the idea that one could live a life completely focused and oriented towards cleansing the heart felt so intuitively right to me and as if it had articulated something I'd known and searched for my whole life and there was an intuition of gold light and uh, I started meditating. I know another monk who was looking up Buddhism on Wikipedia when he was about 16 years old and was reading the article and read the sentence Craving is the source of suffering. And he said, that's, that's true. And then he looked up the next paragraph and it had the image of a monk meditating on a hill. And he went down to his mom and said, mom, I am going to be a monk. And he's a monk. I know another practitioner who did something similar, but he didn't actually become a monk. He uh, got a golden bowl somewhere and told his mom she needed to bring him food in his room and I don't think she did but the intention was good long Sumedha was in the Navy and he read what the Buddha taught by Bhante Ruhula and in his characteristic voice he said and then I realized I'm a Buddhist and he went to Thailand and ordained Something in us knows that there's more to this realm than just what we see, that there's a greater purpose to life than a well-adjusted middle-class existence. And that moment where you first, first begin to intuit what that could be, that there's actually a path, is precious. It's one of the most meaningful moments in in our whole trajectory of, of life. And I think there's something very profound hidden in the fact that we all somehow know we've lost our way. Longpur Cha calls uh, the heart our true home. And we all understand somehow that we've lost our home, that we're not home. And when the heart moves out into the world looking for that, feeding off of it, the Buddha gave the analogy of fire, feeding off of logs, bound, agitated, burning, confined. It knows it's not, deep down it knows it can't be satiated. It knows it's tying itself to something 
that is shifting and disintegrating in front of it, that it's reaching into a liquid looking for a solid. And when that heart tries, stops trying to feed off of the world and begins cultivating a different route, a different path, the Buddha characterized the path to Nibbana as an overgrown path to an ancient city, lost and now revealed. The switch is to the image of light and light that lands on nothing. And the Buddha was so careful not to speak exactly about what Nibbana was. There's two roots to articulating truth. There's apophatic method, which is articulating truth by what it is not. And there's cataphatic method, which is articulating truth by naming it, by what it is. And cataphatic net method, naming truth by what it is, has a danger of reifying it, of making us cling to an idea in words. And reality is always beyond words. And the Buddha recognized this and saw the real danger as practitioners when you encounter a new state of concentration or joy or unification of heart, often it's the most precious thing you've ever touched. And the drive or draw to define that as enlightenment or as God is almost irresistible to take that as the ultimate because it's the best thing we've ever encountered. And the Buddha saw that happen time and again. His teachers all become, became stopped, to, uh, became hung up on refined states of concentration, thinking that they had attained enlightenment. I remember when I was about to ordain, I talked to a friend about this deep-rooted search of mine, and he said, enlightenment, yeah, I took ecstasy once. I think I've touched that before. I think I was quiet. But the intuition deep down to follow that, the Buddha recognized the danger. And so he was, I think, one of the most strict, apophatic teachers in history. Instead of articulating in detail what nirvana, what enlightenment was, he names it. But mainly he names it by what it is not. He says it's the cessation of greed, hatred, and delusion. It's the cessation of ignorance. It's the fire going out. But then as to what that is, he's not going to give us a detailed answer because we will cling to it. And what he says is, look, practice for the sake of letting go. And when you touch what's beyond all your clinging, it's, you'll know it for yourself. There's no need to say much more about it. But the issue is coming from a North European culture, uh, or at least much of our culture is influenced by that, when we think about a fire going out, which was the analogy of nibbana, cooling, it literally means, we have an intuition of darkness and death. But that analogy was given in the Ganges River Valley, where things are really hot. A fire going out was not bad. And the Buddhists and the Hindus at the time had the conception that when fire disappeared, it turned back into this all-pervading energy. Uh, they called it Agi. And when the Buddha was pressed to give an analogy of the enlightened mind, he said, it is light that lands on nothing. So when we let go, we aren't left with nothing, but there can be that intuition at first when we encounter the path and hear about these translations of nirvana as extinction of emptiness. But it's just empty of self and filled with reality, filled with something beyond what we can speak, but that somehow we intuit deep down. And the Buddha said it was beyond anything we'd conceived of. The characteristics of experience, anicca, anatta, dukkha, not self, or impermanence, not self, and suffering. The deathless isn't the opposite of anicca. 
the opposite of a Nietzsche, impermanent, is Nietzsche, permanent. But the deathless, the Buddha said, was beyond time. It was Amata, the deathless. Similarly, death is not the opposite of birth. Death is the result of birth. And the deathless, Nibbana, is something apart from all of that. So that's awful abstract. But it's useful to know that we can touch moments of this cessation. Ajahn Buddha Dasa said, if we didn't experience little moments of cooling, of Nibbana, every day, we would be insane. And it's true, you can we pass over them so easily because dukkha is how we orient ourselves. The last thing you can take from people is their dukkha. So we skip over it. But notice when the suffering subsides, when the anger cools, there's a moment of silence. And this is an intuition of what it means to be cool. And the Buddha laid out these four stages of awakened being. And I really think it's important to bring back these figures, this progression into our view because we're not meditating to lower our blood pressure. We're not meditating to be slightly happier. It helps with those things, but we're meditating and we practice for the complete liberation of the heart. And you begin to meet people as you enter these realms of practitioners, of monastics, who are different than anyone you've ever met. They are pure. They have an unshakability to them that you've never touched, you've never intuited, you've never seen. And I remember searching throughout my lay life for someone who seemed a little different. And then finally, I met some monastics who did. And it should shake you. Uh, I remember seeing the video of Ajahn Chah giving an interview at Chithurst. And like Ajahn, uh, there's a monk named, um, I think, Warapanya, who's disrobed now, Joseph, Kap no, not Joseph, I forgot his name, Paul Breider. And he said, Ajahn Chah looked like a frog on its lily pad, happy. And I thought, I would do anything to be like that. And it's true, you could just see it in the video, there is something different. And when you realize that we are capable of that, how can you aim for anything else? You don't have to believe in rebirth. You don't have to believe Nibbana's mapped onto an ontology, a view of the world apart from just what you see if you don't want to. But maybe you can entertain the idea that it is possible for a human being to be utterly selfless. It is possible. And how can we aim for anything other than that once we know? I remember uh, hearing about a woman uh, entering a commune, uh, a Christian commune, and she said, I asked myself what I would have to give up to pursue this life. And I realized the answer came back that I'd have to give up everything. And I realized it was worth it. And we don't have to give up everything on the surface. We can keep living our lives, but the beauty of this path is that it overlays and transmutes a normal a seemingly mundane life into something transcendent and noble. Monks' lives are pretty routine, even, and, and yet the routine is where the transcendent is found. External conditions are simply tools. So the Buddha laid out this progression of how the mind awakens. He said, first there's the attainment of stream entry, the first encounter with Nibbana. It's your first vision. And the heart isn't ready yet to completely jump. So this is usually portrayed as a flash of lightning. The Buddha says there's three kinds of mind. There's the mind like a, <laughs> I think he says a raw pustule, where one is angry and immediately spits out angry words when abused. So this is like a raw pustule where you, you poke it and it spits out pus. The second kind of mind is mind like a lightning strike, and that's the mind of a sotapanna, a stream enterer, where they've seen truth for one instant, and then darkness comes again. And then there's the mind like a diamond, which is the mind of an arahant, a completely awakened being, flawless, clear, 
able to cut through anything. I love that list. And uh, this stream enter of mind, they say that the f three fetters, there's 10 fetters to be let go of. The Buddha loves lists and they're so helpful. But this one is 10 fetters that you release towards complete liberation, these bonds. And the first three you release are Sakaya Ditti, self view, which is assuming that you are the khandas, the focus points of identity, the body, perception, feeling, mental formations, consciousness, basically your focal points of identity. A stream enter no longer identifies with those. The second is skeptical doubt in the teaching and the path. A stream enterer knows that there's a path to liberation and has an intuition for what that is because they've seen the deathless, how can they doubt? And the third is sila pata paramasa, which is attachment to rites and rituals. And often this is expanded to include attachment to your kind of cultural conditioning, our ways of operating in the world. And a stream enterer has seen beyond those and those three fetters drop. And the Buddha says that a stream enterer only has seven lifetimes left to live after that attainment. So the next level, the Buddha says, is the once returner, which means that uh, sensual desire and ill will are further weakened. The third stage is the non returner, which sensual desire and ill will are completely let go of. Those are the next two fetters. And they will uh, purportedly never be reborn as a human again. And then there's the final five fetters that drop into complete awakening, arahantship, conceit, ignorance, uh, desire for rebirth in the fine material and immaterial realms, and restlessness. So you hear those, and it seems like this sort of esoteric leveling system. If anyone's played, you know, some, it seems very strange and arbitrary. So it's really useful to see what's happening is the first three fetters that drop attachment to this body, uh, the khandas, identifying with them, skeptical doubt, and uh, attachment to rites and rituals. This is the level of our cultural conditioning. This is the conditions that we take on since birth, uh, identifying with our name, our nationality, our gender, our personality, those are the khandas that you let go, you no longer identify with. We're no longer trapped by our vision of how our culture must operate um, because we've seen beyond it, or that's what a stream enter would, would intuit. And because they've touched the deathless for a moment, there's no doubt that there's a path, and that's embedded in the heart forever, is something has seen truth and that can't be undone. And that's the letting go of skeptical doubt of the teaching. And as to why that leads to uh, only a certain number of rebirths is if you believe in rebirth, uh, there's this idea that at death there's a life review where you kind of flash back through your life. And I've heard some say that a stream enter on that life review sees the deathless they see that moment of flashing lightning, they see that vision, and it's so powerful, it automatically uh, propels their mind upwards. They can't fall, not deeply. And a stream enter will dedicate their whole life to this path. It's their intuition of what is they're capable of is uh, unchangeable. And the Buddha was so clear that this is a achievable goal. I feel I know lay people who have attained stream entry. This does happen, it is possible. You can hear sp people speak about the shift in the heart that is uh, completely irreversible, that changes their entire trajectory. And it's useful not to get caught in these systems if often people will think, am I a stream enter, am I not? If you're asking, you're probably not, <laughs> but it's useful to know it's possible. It's possible to touch something which is irreversible in the heart.
The next level the Buddha speaks about is the once returner, which is the person who it further practice attenuates uh, sensual desire and ill will. And this, it says that they'll only be reborn in the human realm once more. And this utter, ushers into the third level, an anagami, or the non-returner, who is never reborn in the human realm. And the fetters they let go of are ill will and desi sensual desire. And once again, this isn't an arbitrary leveling system. That's the biological level of conditioning. Every animal, every biological system has ill will and sensual desire. All beings flee from pain and all beings are attracted to kind of nourishment and pleasure. That's the basic biological mandate. So a non-returner lets go of an even deeper strata of conditioning of the body. The stream enterer lets go of the conditioning of social, uh, social conditioning. The anagami lets go of biological conditioning. And the Buddha says that that being will re be reborn in uh, the pure abodes, which are said to be these, realm of pra these realms of practice uh, that are immaterial. You don't have to believe in these things, but the Buddha spoke about them. And the fourth level, and there were many lay people that the Buddha spoke about who are anagamis as well, chitta the householder, this is attainable. And the fourth level, the complete awakening, is the arahant. And the fetters that are let go of here are rebirth in the fine material realm, the immaterial realm, conceit, restlessness, and ignorance. And this is uh, letting go of the deepest roots of ignorance at the level of the mind. The stream enter lets go of social conditioning. The anagami lets go of biological, and the arahant lets go of the deepest patterning in the mind. And that is awakening. And the Buddha said that an arahant uh, is never reborn. But it's not nothing either. Many people approached the Buddha and asked, what happens to the Tathagata, to you after death? And the Buddha said, basically, that question doesn't apply. They said, does the Tathagata exist, not exist, both exist and exist, neither exist nor not exist? And the Buddha said, it does not apply. It's beyond words. There's a beautiful illustration of the difference between that first fetter of identity view and conceit. There's a monk named Kemika who's sick and dying. And some elder monks send a messenger over to Venerable Kemika and say, uh, we hear you're dying, how are you feeling? And he says, I'm not feeling too well, I'm dying. And they say, have you attained awakening? And he says, no. And they say, do you identify with any of the aggregates? And he says, no. And they say, how can you not be awakened if you don't identify with any of the aggregates, with the body, perception, feeling, mental formations, consciousness? And he says, look, it's like the scent of a flower. If you look at a flower, can you say the scent comes from the petals, from the stamen, from the stem? You can't say it comes from any of those, and yet the, st the scent remains. Similarly, I don't identify with the body. I don't identify with feeling, perception, mental formations, or consciousness. But this vague scent of the self remains. And then, at that moment, Venerable Kamika became the one monk in the suttas to become awakened from his own Dharma talk. <laughs> so may we all be so lucky. But it's such a beautiful illustration. Even someone who no longer believes they are these this body, this mind, there's still some residual sense of me and mine, asmi mana in Pali, the scent of a flower, and that's just steadily dispelled. And an arahant is selfless, it's not nothing. There can be this intuition in the West that if you let go of all these cravings, what's left? Do you just become this dry automaton? And I feel I know arahants, and that's not what they're like. There's nothing left but the 
inclination to do good, to give completely. There's an emptiness about them. Every action echoes, it seems, forever through them. The Buddha said the karma you create by giving to an arahant is uh, immense. And it's possible. And it's important to look at what the Buddha laid out as the basic approach to finding our way to home. And that's home. He said that everyone who isn't an arahant is basically uh, mentally deranged, all of us. The arahants are the only sane people. And the Buddha said that the route to stream entry, the four conditions, two of them are external, sadhamma sawanang and saparisa sangseva, association with good people and hearing the true dhamma, and two of them are internal, yoni so manasikara and dhamma, dhamma patipada, dhammanu dhamma patipada, practicing dhamma in line with dhamma, so practicing correctly, appropriate attention and a practicing correctly. And these are something we can do. We come and we spend time with practitioners, Kalyanamitta. We enter monasteries when we have the chance. We listen to Dhamma when we can. We steer our attention constantly in line with the Four Noble Truths. And we practice, we meditate uh, daily. And the karma is uh, so potent. People so often lament and really become distressed when their concentration isn't as good as they would like it to be, when their meditation isn't coming together in these profound, bright states of jhana. And they forget to look at what's happening to their life in every other realm. This is a whole path. There's giving, there's right view, there's morality, and just a life looked at through the lens of the Four Noble Truths, oriented towards a path to awakening. It's so powerful, it changes people over time. And it will change us. And people discount this, they forget. And when the cycles of suffering return, because suffering and our old patterns don't just disappear in one go, they come back, and that's a gift because it lets us skim off the surface each time. If we had to let go all at once, it would be too much for many of us. So the Dhamma and Samsara are kind. They, at least it can be looked at this way, they bring these old cycles of suffering back to us again and again. But if you look carefully, you'll notice it lightens, it does, over the years. Uh, but it's not always as fast as we would like I talk about that one monk who went to my teacher and said, when will it be better? And my teacher, Ajahn Anand, said, in five years, it'll be a little bit better. So, and yet it also happens so quickly. Uh, it's, but we're working against lifetimes of patterning. But to have faith that you are exactly where you need to be, this is exactly the conditions you can practice with. And you'll notice that as you let go of more and more things as you become more and more oriented towards the path. Your suffering, it continues to come. It focuses on the things you care about now because our grasping continues, so of course it will be challenged. But if you're able to turn towards these points of suffering, to comprehend the suffering, first noble truth, and to let go, the second, to realize peace, that is the route to liberation. And so every suffering is a gift if you approach it correctly because it's an opportunity to practice the Four Noble Truths and to let go of the deepest strata of our clinging. And the Four Noble Truths, faith, confidence, are self-fulfilling prophecy. If you really bow to the Four Noble Truths, if you really look at your life as a gift given to you for exactly this 
and realize that a life that didn't have dukkha, there'd be no friction, no impetus to separate out the knowing element from the conditions, to pull out those threads of awareness from the cloth of the world. This is what drives us to not be careless, is our dukkha. And in that sense, it can be looked at truly as a gift and exactly where you need to be. So we're all on the route home. We just haven't realized it. And your life doesn't have to change all of a sudden. You don't have to go off and ordain, although you can if you want. But stop and look now and realize that because intention, because this lens of the Four Noble Truths are the quintessential element, the world is ripe for the path home. And how far you can take that does not have a limit. So uh, I wish everyone the best journey uh, home today. So we have a time for questions and discussion. Um, if people want to raise their hand, we can bring a mic over to you and just say your name and what you'd like to talk about. If you're on Zoom, feel free to raise your electronic hand or type your question into the chat. Beautiful talk, thank you. Um, I'm curious if there were any insights or anything we're sharing I'm sure there were, but from your time at the prison yesterday. So uh, we got invited to uh, teach at a, a prison to, to inmates yesterday um, and drove there and then found out that they'd forgotten to register us and couldn't get in. So the good lesson was uh, any good thing you try to do, Mara will usually put up a, a block once or twice that was the second attempt. The first time it had like gotten clean. So my hope is number three is the, the lucky number. Um, but if people haven't seen the documentary, um, there's, does anyone know the one about Goinka practitioners in prison, what the name of that documentary is? The Dharma Brothers, yes. So it's about Goinka practitioners in prison and prisoners live pretty similar lives to monks. And I just think it's this beautiful, I remember seeing a, a picture of the inmates meditating and the nobility that's brought to a human being through that is so amazing. And I just think it speaks to um, the power of shifting view. And uh, there's a book called The Last Breath about Long Porpasano counseling uh, inmate on death row in San Quentin named Jay Siriporng through his final days and just to see what can happen to a heart behind bars if you realize the internal freedom available is profound. So um, no exact insight yet, but hopefully we'll get to go back soon. Who is the mic? Okay. So um, I have a more, I guess, a personal question. So what was your experience with stream entry? I'm not a stream enterer, ah. to be very clear. Yeah. Um, hmm. yeah, I know of people who are, I think. Um, it's useful to know in the Sangha, the monastics aren't supposed to speak about the names of those who are enlightened or about their psychic powers uh, because it's to avoid creating a cult of personality and it's a beautiful rule. Um, and the Buddha was clear, his uh, stepmother, Maha Pajapati, tried to offer him a robe and he said, offer it to the Sangha. The Sangha is more merit even than the Tathagata. And there's this beautiful idea that even an enlightened being, the institution of the Sangha and four or more monastics together, that's the most powerful 
field of karma possible. And I, I think the two things resonate with each other in that we're supposed to avoid talking about our own awakening experiences or not, um, or other monks, which is why I didn't name the monks I think who are enlightened, but I think they exist, except for Ajahn Chai. I think, I think we all kind of feel that about him, at least I do. Um, but it avoids uh, that cult of personality and, and lets people just appreciate the teaching as it is, so yes. But I do feel I know lay people who have attained stream entry. I think multiple ones, and it is possible. Mary, please. Hello, Ajahn. Hello, everybody. Um, I have two questions, if I can take the time. One is this empty of self state. And it seems to me, and I'm checking this out with you, if one is empty of self, then one's whole self, the definition that one gives to everything from one's understanding, from this, how to say this, that then the self definition of phenomena has to stop too. Then phenomena is not self ascribed. Does that make sense? You get that? Uh, give me a little more. Okay, so I perceive a tree. I perceive a tree, and I have all my associations with it. They come from my sense of self. This is a tree. This is what it does. And if there's no sense of self, then that sense of phenomena also changes. Is that so? Yes. Yes, I thank you. Thank you for that. No, careful I, answer. I, uh, I go for your second question, Mary, but I'll, I'll circle. I'll circle back around to say a little more about that as well. Okay, and the second one, um, it's beyond me. It's about you said an arhant. Arhant lets go of the mind, and I don't think I'm developed enough to even understand that. But does that mean that the chitta is not there? If they let go of mind, heart mind, is the chitta gone? Gosh, I should have expected questions like this when I gave this talk. These are great <laughs> questions, Mary. <laughs> Thank you. I, um, first, I didn't necessarily, great questions. And I, I didn't necessarily mean to say that the arahant lets go of the mind so much as the patterning in the mind. Okay, I can get that. And I think what they let go of is the, it's the fetters. And one of the fetters with that that I consider so important to see is the fetter of conceit and restlessness. Yeah. This sort of, because we sort of define, feel ourselves by that constant hovering and movement. And when that's let go of, something happens. And there's a book called Mechi Geo, who is a, uh, people believe an enlightened Mechi, um, an enlightened nun uh, from about, I think she died about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And there de there's a description in her book of her final stage of awakening described by Ajahn Mahabua. Or maybe it was Ajahn Mahabua, her teacher, describing his final awakening. And he talks about coming to this glowing center of the mind. And then he realizes that that itself is ignorance and let's go of that and suddenly there's um, the deathless. So what happens at those upper echelons of practice I think is almost, you know, it's beautiful to get these glimpses but as to exactly what it is, um, that's something I think we have to experience for ourselves. The chitta, which is the word for the mind and heart, the mind heart, they, it is a beautiful quote and relevant that people don't become enlightened, chittas become enlightened. But, and Long Pursu Chitto gives the best description of chitta I've ever heard. And there does seem to be an element where that, yeah, I, I can't speak more to it, but yes, there's something about the chitta and enlightenment happening there, and I don't know what exactly that is. It's but okay, it's okay. We'll wait to find out. Exactly. And the <laughs> <laughs> no, and the Buddha was, his restraint as a teacher was so amazing because 
people pressed him on these issues in his own time. They said, what happens after death? What, or sorry, what, do, what is enlightenment exactly? What happens to you after you, you the Tathagata, after you die? Do you exist? And some of them, there's one monk who even threatened to disrobe if, they didn't, if he didn't tell him. And the Buddha said, did I ever say, come ordain with me, and I will teach you the beginning of the world, and I will teach you what happens to Tathagata after death. Did I ever say that? And the monk says, no, no, you didn't. And the Buddha said, I said, I will teach you suffering and the end of suffering. And the monk said, yes, yes, you did, and practiced. And the Buddha's restraint in his pragmatism, because we get so wound up in these questions of what exact sort of self are we letting go of, and what exactly does that look like, I think the Buddha's restraint around steering us back towards the act of letting go is so admirable and precious. And it's let, so um, all to say that I can't answer your question there. Um, That's okay, it's a good pondering. Um, yeah, yes. It's a good pondering. It just seems back to the first one, when you're empty of self, you're empty of desire, and therefore the perception of what you see is free of desire. And yeah. Absolutely. And then everything would look almost the same. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and well, the thing is, the, the Buddha said that when one becomes enlightened, they called it nibbana with remainder, which meant that mm. the, the khandas that exist, the body remains for another year, a few years, and, and all these aggregates still function, perception, etc. But you're right, they'll never be motivated by craving, by the defilements. Okay. And, and there's also not this renewed becoming so when those khandas disappear yes all phenomena dissolve mm -hmm. and there's a state of concentration the buddha says is only accessible to non-returners and arahants called the perception of feeling and perception and that seems to speak to exactly what you're talking about with maybe things can dissolve in that moment mm -hmm. um, but the buddha was very you know that's a state that is inarticulatable because it's only accessible to people who have touched enlightenment. Yeah. I want to thank you for your answers and I want to thank you for that really beautiful talk. It was really quite um, touching and encouraging. So thank you very much, Aja. Thank you, Mary. Uh, let me know if you find the answers to those questions. I'll be right on it. <laughs> <laughs> Another Zoom question, please, uh, top left. Hello, Ajahn Sibong. I am so happy to finally get to speak to you. Um, I've been watching your Dharma talks like for the past few months and I just really appreciate you. I live in New York City, so I'm not nearby to go visit, <laughs> but I would like to. Um, Where, do you live? Where do you live again? New York City. New York City. Okay. Um, that is a drive. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's great to meet you. Yeah. And please, if you're ever in Seattle, we have people who can host you. Yeah. Uh, oh, cool. Go for it. What's, okay. your, what's your question? So um, I was wondering, like, I'm going through a lot of dukkha right now in my practice, um, but also, like, feels empowering because I'm able to hold my dukkha. Like, it's, like, past, like, you know, dukkha from the past. Um, and it's like sort of bringing up um, a desire to, like, I don't, like, it's hard to tell if it's from like a wounded place or I'm like, I feel like I've been betrayed by like family, society in such a deep way that like, I'm like, oh yeah, then like, I should like, you know, it, ma it makes sense to me logically that I should be a monastic, right? Um, because it's like, I can give my all in that sense because Buddhism is what is healing my dukkha in a very significant way. And so it's like that sort of um, trust in relationship is is like really strong in comparison. It's almost like a huge contrast. Um, but I was, my main question is like, you know, um, that desire to be a monastic seems to be coming from a wounded place. And I don't know how like solid that is. What's your name? One more time. Guadalupe. Guadalupe. Great to meet you. Thank you. Um, great question. 
I think there's a lot of people in the audience who have that in them too. I think it's really common and wholesome when you encounter the path and begin to intuit its power. It's the best thing. I mean, these teachings are amazing and I think it makes complete sense to feel that contrast with everything you've touched before. And sometimes the discrepancy becomes so clear that that leap, leaping up of the heart towards another path is, how could it not have that intuition to some extent? I think that desire to move into a complete renunciation of the world or towards a monastic form is archetypal. So it, it's something that lives in most of us. I think most practitioners have somewhere in their heart, like maybe if my spouse died, maybe if my kids grew up, maybe someday. And I think it's important um, to have that part of our hearts and it has form and I think when it comes up, especially at the beginning of practice, it's really good to, to speak to it and, and let it gather light. It's sort of a gem and, and let it gather sunlight, hold it out and um, follow its intuition in the sense of, uh, you know, there, it's really seductive to try to make these big decisions, but just go to a monastery for a few days. In the East Coast, there's Empty Cloud, there's Temple, you may have already tapped into those, there's Bhavana Society. And that's just good to do as a practitioner, is spend a few days there, spend a few weeks. And these decisions are far too big for the head to make. You need to just go there in person. And what often happens is you, you honor that intention by going there, by dedicating more of your life to the practice. And then you realize actually what you've found is good enough. And you sort of come to a centered place where you don't actually have to change that much. But I'd say, especially initially, any large leap into something completely out of the blue, usually it's best just to take little steps. And often what happens is, you know, you begin exploring, go visit monasteries, and that gem that's gathered sunlight, you know, it becomes one lighthouse among many in your life. And you're guiding yourself by a lot of stars, but you find that actually very little had to change on the surface of your life, maybe. Or, or maybe the big externals didn't. You still got to keep the job. You're just meditating more. Um, so I'd say, like, honor that intuition as an archetypal indicator of something deep in you. Let it take you to the monastery. But understand that if it doesn't lead you to actually ordaining, it's not less, and your life won't be less for that necessarily. Your karma might not be right for that at this moment, maybe you have other obligations. At the same time, if you do go to monasteries and you really love it, if you have the inclination to ordain and have the ability, the world needs monastics, especially women monastics, and yeah, go for it, but I'm biased. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's always a balance of like, yes, that's beautiful, explore it, go to monasteries, um, and people can live amazing lives of practice where they are. And the trick is not to fracture your heart between the two and forget the beauty of the situation you, you find yourself in. So Dharma is duty and follow, follow what you feel your heart and external circumstances give you as a duty. Does that help at all, Guadalupe? Yes, just talking to you helps. So thank okay. you so much. Um, and yes, I've been to Empty Cloud, and I do plan. I have reached out about residency, so this is all oh, really good. Well, yeah, you're, that's the correct step. Good. Way to go. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So we have to wrap stuff up. Um, let